Hello, and welcome to A Gross of Physics. Today is day 54, and what we're going to talk about today is using the circle's characteristics in order to calculate for speed. Now, we already discussed that velocity is not going to be useful to us in circular motion because the velocity is a vector. And as time moves forward, the velocity will be based on displacement because it's displacement over time. Well, the displacement over the trip of a circular path is zero. So if we use our traditional equation of delta v over delta t, we're going to end up getting zero for the velocity and then zero for the acceleration. So what we do is we come up with a new equation that allows us to calculate for the centripetal acceleration, and that's v squared over r. But in many cases, you won't be given the speed. You'll have to use the circle's characteristics in order to calculate it. Well, remember, speed is just distance over time, not displacement. So if we can find the distance an object travels around the circle, we're going to be able to calculate the speed using d over t. Now, in a circle, the distance we travel around the outside of, of the circle is known as the circumference. So if we know the equation for circumference, which is 2 pi r, we're going to be able to use that for d and then use the time period of the circle in order to solve for the t. Then we'll just have to find d over t and calculate the speed. Now, that being said, when we're talking about circular motion, we're talking about cyclic motion. So it happens in cycles. So we use the word time period to represent the time it takes to make one oscillation around the circle. In addition to that, we also have a new term, which is called the frequency. Now, frequency is cycles over second, and it's measured in hertz. So we have the equation for frequency to be cycles over second, and the unit is one over seconds, which we simplify to call the hertz. Now, radio stations give out frequencies in hertz. In the AM band, it's in megahertz, 10 to the 6 hertz. And in the FM band, it's kilohertz, 10 to the 3rd hertz. Now, each one of those is listed on your dial of the radio. Now, with that said, we have a relationship between the frequency and the time period as well. The frequency and time period are reciprocals, which means that as one goes up, the other goes down. The equation for time period is 1 over f, and the equation for frequency is 1 over t. Now, to dif differentiate between the times, a traditional time, and the time period for circular motion, we could use a subscript of c, tc. But instead, what we do is we use a capital T to denote any time we have circular motion and time period. So that's going to represent the time it takes to make one oscillation. Problems may be given where you're um, given a, a time for the entire trip, and you're told that the object makes multiple trips around the circle. What we're going to need is the time it takes to make one trip. So we might have to simplify that first in order to calculate for time period. In addition, we may have to do that as well to find the frequency. Now, we've been talking about centripetal um, acceleration. There's also a centripetal force. And since centripetal forces are always going to act toward the center of the circle, centripetal meaning center seeking, what we're going to need is an equation to find the centripetal force. Now, our traditional equation is F equals MA. But we now have a new way to find acceleration, and that's V squared over R. So the equation for centripetal force, and we're going to use F sub C to denote centripetal force, is going to be MAC. So it's going to be mass times the centripetal acceleration. Well, most of the time, we simplify that further to use the centripetal acceleration equation that we already know, and that's v squared over r. So many times, you do fc equals mv squared over r. So if you're trying to find the acceleration by itself, you'll just do v squared over r. If you're trying to find the centripetal force, you would do mv squared over r. So you take the mass, which is in kilograms, and multiply it by the v squared, which is the speed squared, over the radius. Now, force is still measured in newtons, and that's because the meters squared over seconds squared, one of the meters is canceled out by the radius on the bottom. So you're still left with kilogram meter over second squared, which is mass times acceleration. So in order to find centripetal acceleration, v squared over r, centripetal force, mv squared over r. 
Now, what's odd is that we'll never see a centripetal force by itself. There's no way I can just show you a centripetal force. In fact, it's always going to be the force that keeps an object moving in the circular path. So if we have an object on a string and we whirl it around our head, tension will be the centripetal force in that case. If you have an object such as the moon orbiting the Earth, gravity will be the centripetal force in that case. A car traveling around a circular path on the ground without slipping, friction is going to provide that centripetal force. We could even have the normal force holding an object in its circular path if you're doing a loop-de-loop, -loop, let's say in a car or with a matchbox car or something like that. So the centripetal force is always just the name of another force that happens to be keeping the object in the circle. If an object's not going in a, circular for, in a circular path, it doesn't have a centripetal force acting on it, and it will just have a normal force or perhaps no forces, maybe just friction, will act on it to slow it down. So whenever an object is traveling in a circular path, the centripetal force is the reason it's doing so. That force acts towards the center, and we're going to be able to use mv squared over r to calculate it. We could even use a free body diagram. We'll do some problems with that in a little while. But for now, the centripetal acceleration is a equals v squared over r. Centripetal force is mv squared over r. And perhaps we might have to use the circle itself to find the speed. And that might be useful to do d over t. But remember, the distance of a circle is the circumference which is 2 pi r. So we're going to use 2 pi r over t. And the t in this case is always going to be capital T for time period. If you're given the frequency, you may have to find the reciprocal first in order to find the speed. Now, that being said, we can even use a new equation, which is 2 pi r f to find the speed itself. And that's useful when we talk about rotational motion. We often use 2 pi r f to denote the circular motion and then rotational motion. But for our course, we'll stick to um, distance over time, which is circumference over time, which is 2 pi r over time period, capital T. At this point, let's do some sample problems, and we'll see if we can solve for um, perhaps the centripetal force being gravity, or the centripetal force being the tension, or even perhaps the centripetal force being friction. All right, now we have an RC airplane traveling in a circular path. And the path is going to be horizontal. So if the person is standing here, the plane, and let's, this is my favorite part, drawing planes. Uh, let's see. Oh, look at this. High tech. Um, that's going to travel in a horizontal path. And it is making 15 loops per minute. So the minute's going to be an issue there. And it's a horizontal circle of radius 25 meters. So the radius is 25 meters. And we want to find the centripetal acceleration. Now, of course, we know that the acceleration equation is v squared over r. The acceleration, if this was horizontal, the acceleration is going to be inward to the center at all points. So if it's over here, it's center. If it's up here, it's centered. And if it's over here, it's centered. So no matter where it is, it always points to the middle. We have the radius already. But what we're going to have to need is the velocity. Now, if we remember, velocity is distance over time. And in fact, because we're only worried about the, the magnitude instead of the velocity itself, we're really looking at speed because the velocity is ever-changing because the direction changes. But the number is going to stay the same. Now, we need to remember that the distance around the outside of a circle is called the circumference. And the calculation is pi d, or since we already have the radius, 2 pi r. And then the time is actually the time period, how long it takes to make one loop. So. This is going to be the tricky part because we did 15 loops in a minute. So 15 cycles per 60 seconds, which is actually our frequency. So how do you get the time period? Well, frequency and time period are reciprocals. So what we can do is take the 60 
and put it on the top and the 15 on the bottom. We basically flip the numbers upside down. So the time period is 60 seconds in 15 cycles. All right, now I think that's a familiar number to me, and I think it's 4, but let's verify. 60 divided by 15, look at that, it's 4. So the time period is 4 seconds. Well, let's think about this. We have 60 seconds, and it does 15 cycles. So if it does 4 seconds a cycle, that makes sense. 4 times 15 is 60. So we can realize that in order to find the velocity, we're going to do 2 pi times 25 meters over 4 seconds. So the velocity, or I'm sorry, the speed again, velocity is always tangent, 2 times 3.14 times 25, and if you have the pi button on your calculator, you can use that. It's 157 divided by 4. And you get, for the speed, 39.25 meters per second. But of course, we don't want just the speed. We want the centripetal acceleration. So it's going to be V squared over R, which is 39.25 meters per second squared over 25 meters. Well, let's see what we get. Since the 39.25 is already in my calculator, I'm just going to hit the square button. And then I'm going to divide by 25. And my centripetal acceleration in this case is 61.6 .6 meters per second squared. And that would be a multiple of gravity. Now there's another term that we use in physics and that's called G's. Sometimes G-force. And that's just how many times bigger than gravity something is accelerating. So if I actually divide this by 9.8, and of course this isn't part of the problem, but 61.6 .6 divided by 9.8 tells me how many multiples of the g, which is the acceleration of gravity we have. And this is actually 6.3 g's. Now the human body can only handle a certain number of g's before it actually cannot pump oxygen in the bloodstream uh, to different body parts. So actually over a certain number of G's for an extended period of time you could actually lose, um, first you lose vision because your, your blood can't pump to your optical nerves and then ultimately you would lose consciousness because blood can't pump to your brain. So G-force is something that's really important when we um, when we have people that, that fly in, in jet planes and things like that that accelerate at high high rates of acceleration, but that's also something that's important when when designing um, things like roller coasters in amusement parks because you want your riders to experience uh, the thrill of acceleration but not you know become unconscious while they're while they're riding. So it's important for um, roller coaster designers and engineers to make sure that the g-force uh, during certain parts of the trip are within the tolerances of the human body. So the acceleration of this plane is 61.6 .6 meters per second squared. That's the answer to our problem. However, we can convert that to G's, which is just how many times bigger than 9.8 something is. In this case, it's 6.3 G's.